The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to NOVA's presentation of Introduction to 401k Plans for Plan Sponsors uh, with Allison Grandal and Ginger Henry. Before we get started, I would like to point out the panel that's on the top right-hand corner of your computer screen. You will see a drop-down section for questions. This is where you will enter in any questions that you may have for Allison and Ginger. Please keep in mind that the Q&A portion of this webinar will be held at the end and they will answer as many questions as time permits. If time does run out and you still have questions, please email them uh, to our email address, webinars at nova, nova401k.com. Uh, right below chat, you will see the handouts drop down. Here you will be able to download today's material. If you are unable to download the material, you can reach out to our email and I can forward that over to you. If you are with us today to earn continued education credits, please be sure to stay until the very end and fill out our pop-up pop -up survey. This will allow us to track your time and participation. Certificates will be sent out within a week for those who have met the time requirement. To view any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel which is Nova401k Associates, or visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you for joining us today. I would now like to introduce from Nova's East Coast and East Coast 2 team, Senior Account Manager Ginger Henry and Account Manager Allison Grandall. Hi, good afternoon. As Yvette said, my name is Ginger Henry, and um, I'll be doing the first part of this presentation today. Um, thank you for joining. I know it's a busy time of year and um, I know there's a lot going on. I just have a few housekeeping items. Um, first, this presentation is um, just of general nature. It's not intended to substitute for legal or tax advice. And if you need um, to consult with an accountant or attorney, please do so for uh, legal or tax advice as well. As Yvette said, if you need um, continuing education credits, you're welcome to do so. Our number is 009820. Um, please be sure to attend the full webinar and after it co is completed, you'll be asked a few questions and then we'll send out your certification within a week. Okay, let's get down to business. We have a lot to cover. Um, this is our agenda for today. Um, as probably many of you are new to the 401k world, maybe just started a plan in 2023. We welcome you, congratulations on starting a plan. And there may be others who um, had a plan for a while but still have questions, which we welcome. Um, we're gonna discuss roles and responsibilities, um, talk a little bit about cybersecurity, which is always important, and then get into the nitty gritty with the 401k basics, um, some moving pieces with discrimination testing, and then finally going over some distribution and loan basics and then um, you know go over our calendar which will help you kind of understand expectations and uh, what a year looks like on, in the 401k world so first i'd like to go over as you can see there have several part we partner with several different um, companies that assist you so you're not alone in your 401k world and we want you to feel like you can reach out to nova or your advisor or the investment provider and we're all in this together uh, we have over overlapping roles and as i say to many of my clients it takes a village to run a 401k plan um, so first let's go over talk about each one of these you're the plan sponsor as you probably are aware um, as the client and you sponsor the your 401k plan so you're ultimately uh, fiduciary responsible for your plan. You also communicate your plan to your new employees. Um, you also remit your contributions um, and you also provide information to NOVA as your TPA. So you're a you know, big part of this process. And then we move over to the financial advisor or maybe call the broker. And they're also very important because um, they help in selecting your um, your vendor and um, you know your funds. You want to get a, a diverse um, array of funds that you want to provide to your employees. They also provide participant education and enrollment meetings, which is important um, to get your employees excited about joining the 401k plan. And the more meetings you have, the better, so they understand it. They're not afraid of the of the plan. 
Um, and then um, finally, they also make sure your plan is 404C compliant. And that is important um, you know, to keep your plan legal. You want to make sure that you're offering a variety of funds with different types of risk and um, you know different um, you know for different types of employees. So uh, a big a big part of your plan. And then we move over to investment providers. So that is you know we call them maybe the record keeper, uh, the vendor. We work with about 20 different vendors: John Hancock, Empower, Principal, Voya, Lincoln. Um, you know it's it's whatever the client would you know, whoever they'd like to work with. And they are important. They hold the assets of your plan. They're the custodian and, um, and also important part because your employees will go online and they can enroll in the plan. They can request distributions and loans. Um, it's, it's a daily record keeper so they can go out and check their balances and, um, you know, make changes, uh, transfers, uh, deferral changes, and um, you know they could, they also that's where you're submitting your payroll contribution, so they get those invested for you. And finally, you know, and importantly, is Nova. We are your third party administrator, and um, we are important into this. We're like the backbone of your 401k plan. We handle all the compliance, um, testing, 5500. We keep your plan legal if you have corrections that need to be done. And we're also a great resource to call anytime you have a designated account manager. And, you know, we're, we're wanting to help you out to keep your plan um, legal and, and, you know, help you keep your employees um, satisfied and happy with the plan. So that just gives you an idea of the roles. Um, we couldn't have this um, webinar today without talking a little bit about cybersecurity. That's important, as you probably already know in your business from, from your other benefits. Is, you know, we handle a lot of confidential information and the um, hackers are out there. They're looking, they're looking for, for us specifically because we do have so much confidential information. So we always have to be on our toes and make sure that um, we're doing our due diligence, all of us as a, as a team, and making sure that you know the emails don't get hacked, um, and then they get into the record keeper and they can you know request distributions, um, you know, impersonating an employee. So that's that's very important for your plan. Um, and these these thefts are not covered by maybe some of the insurance policies that you might have, the fidelity bond, which is required by your 401k plan your fiduciary insurance and your um, E&O insurance, it doesn't cover this. So that's something else to um, think about. Uh, we all wanna be alert and do our part in preventing um, you know, hackers um, from getting into the confidential information and we wanna protect our participants accounts. Some of the files and information that's confidential um, is kind of summarized here. But basically, it's any anything that that we might be sharing to and from you. You want to um, be cognizant that many of, of the information probably has social security numbers on it. So you know, definitely our census files, our testing, our valuation reports, even tax forms, all have confidential information. So we publish this information on our website so that you can easily pull it. Um, and it's encrypted so that you can, you know, have it and then you can also share back the information to us as we need it. As you probably already know, we this is our uh, website, um, our plan sponsor link, and we talk about it all the time. That is where you can post um, your secure information. And it's an encrypted software and it's secure so that we can avoid any kind of hackers. Um, and something else to be aware of that NOVA does um, make sure that we, um, if we get a new contact, we are always confirming that um, they are authorized to be a, you know, a contact and to have website access. We, we make sure we confirm with an existing contact before we ever give them any access to our system. And furthermore, NOVA, you know, make sure that we have quarterly, we're required to have uh, training every quarter to keep up with, you know, the latest and greatest with the hackers and as, as a reminder for ourselves as well um, to do our due diligence. And then our passwords are required to be reset every 90 days, as I'm sure you guys probably, we have 100 different passwords. And so they're always being reset to 
complicated, complex um, password that is not easily, uh, you know, stolen. Um, with our website, this is a few um, in summary of, of ways that you, you that we, we you will be using it in January. You know, which is you know less than a month away, we'll be sending out data collection. We're going to look for your 23 census files, and that will be you'll you'll see it. You'll post it out on our on our plan sponsor link. You'll also use our secure file transfer. Right now, we're working on. For example, required minimum distributions and force outs. So we are going back and forth with clients, making sure they're getting the form they need and they sign it and they return it back on our website. And, and um, that's the safest way to um, transfer personal confidential information. And then limiting the number of people that you copy on your emails. I would just you know, limit that to um, whoever is required to be on the email. And then finally, of course, making sure your passwords are complicated as you can see here, that definitely uh, will help you as well. Now, moving on to 401k basics. So, as you probably know, you know that your the 401k plan is your biggest tool for recruiting and retaining your employees. It's 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 what most clients have today. It's replaced the pension plan for most clients, and now it's up to the employee to take responsibility to enroll in their plan and basically own the responsibility of saving for retirement. So it's, it's one of the biggest assets and it's, it's, it's huge. So it's a great way to put away um, pre-tax deductions um, until you retire. Um, it's a valuable employee benefit. So a big part of our job um, is making sure that your plan stays in compliance with the IRS and Department of Labor. And um, it's a big job for us. As you probably know, the Secure 2.0 passed and we have 90 some provisions to go over and um, Congress is keeping us on our toes, but we are making sure that we understand those, that we're communicating those to our employees and making sure that we all stay in compliance, we want your plan to stay legal and we want to make sure that we're communicating that. Um, common sense doesn't always play. Um, you know, what, what we think uh, Congress should do and common sense is not, it's kind of thrown out the window, so to speak. So you might want to, you know, if you have questions, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to your account manager. And of course, your written plan document is crucial. You want to, you know, want to make sure that you're operationally following matches what your plan document states. And if there's questions, you know, don't hesitate. Or if there's any issues that you might have, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us as well. So the IRS, um, you know, they are looking for, you know, their biggest, their biggest um, uh, item is making sure, you know, from a tax standpoint, um, you know, they want to make sure that the plan is following the rules. And that's what our job is. You know, every year we, we test your plan to make sure that it's the non-discrimination is passing, um, that you're following the plan document, you're amending the plan document timely, and then you're following the terms of your plan. So that's, so that's very important. And we are always being kept up to date with the latest uh, regulations. The Department of Labor also plays an important role, as I was saying earlier. You know, they look for, um, they're looking for participants and are you, you know, making timely deposits in your 401k plan? You know, if they're late, then you need to, you owe your employee for the lo any lost earnings that their money was not in the, um, in the account for, you know, wasn't traded. Um, you know, are you offering your new employees the opportunity to enroll and are you being prudent about that? And I would highly recommend that you document your processes in case, you know, the IRS and the Department of Labor can audit, can pick you randomly for an audit. And you want to make sure that you are being due diligent with your processes and documenting that you provided the annual notices, um, you know, and that your that your plan is following the rules as it should be. They also look for to make sure the expenses are reasonable for the plan. You know, you don't want to uh, be caught with expenses that are high. You're charging your participants um, an, an unreasonable amount. And then also the Department of Labor is involved with your 5500, which NOVA also prepares for you. And that is, a, we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's a, a financial statement that is um, filed with them every year. Okay, 
So let's get down to what the some of the important or main issues are with your plan document that you follow. So when you look at your document and you also have your summary plan description and um, you may have a safe harbor notice, but they all talk about the details, you know, the nitty gritty of your, you know, what's your eligibility? Is that one year of service? It may be maybe just six months. It can be, um, you know, whatever works specifically for your plan. And um, you don't want to have an administrative burden. So it's, it needs to be something that you can easily follow um, operationally. And then on top of that, you have entry dates. It could be, you know, the first of the month. It could be quarterly. It could be semi-annually, you know, so it's 1-1 one, one and July 1. Um, and then there's compensation. So along when you when you set up your document, um, a lot of times it's W-2 gross compensation, but you can also um, take out and remove certain parts of compensation, such as bonuses um, and commissions and different things of that nature. Another important part is your employer contribution. We've been talking about employee deferrals and growth. But there's also the employer piece as well. You, you may have a safe harbor plan, you may have profit sharing, or you may want to do an employer match. So you want to make sure that you're following the document as it, st as it states for employer contributions. And then finally, vesting. You know, the, your deferrals and wrath are always 100% vested, but you could have a vesting schedule for your match or profit sharing, such as a six year graded. So it's six years, you're hundred percent. And keep in mind your safe harbor is also hundred percent busted. Okay, let's talk about, um, now we have a plan document and, and it can be amended. So um, you wanna make sure that I have clients that come to me and you know, especially with this long-term part-time that's going on and being announced and making changes, they want to talk about changing their eligibility. And so we talk about, um, you know, making sure that 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 the document gets changed correctly. And then operationally, they go and and change it on their end. And then they change it with the payroll company and also um, the record keeper. So that's important, as well as making uh, plan document changes on a regular IR, you know, the IRS requires them to be changed. It's typically once every six years. And we also make sure that your plan stays up to date with those changes as well. We send you a DocuSign um, for you to, for the trustee to sign the document to review and make sure that it's all in good order. And, um, and if that's, you know, if that's not done, then there's penalties and fees associated with a, a late, a late um, plan document change as well. So here's an example um, of, a, of a plan. Just we're gonna go through a couple of examples of where maybe the, you know, the client's not, not um, you know, wants to, to make a change to their plan document. In this case, they wanna exclude um, hourly employees. So if you wanna make changes to the document, the first thing you should do is reach out to your account manager um, because you want to get a change in the document, but you also, in this case, you want to make sure it still passes coverage. You don't want to eliminate your hourly employees and then find out you failed testing and you owe money. So that would be a, you know, that's something that you know, want to keep in mind when you talk about excluding different groups of employees from your plan. Here's another example. So here in this example, um, we're talking about uh, what is the preferred, in, in preferred investment alternative for employee puts money in their 401k plan but fails to make an investment election. So let's say you have an employee that made you know 10% deferrals, um, but they never went in and uh, selected a fund. So you have what's called um, you should have you know a, a, a fund called a QDIA fund. And um, a lot of times those are target date funds or lifestyle balance funds, as you probably have heard, that's based off, you know, um, your age and your retirement date. And often they'll use those as the QDIA, QDIA, QDIA fund that your, that your account would be um, defaulted to. So it's still invested. And, and then at any time in the future, the employee can go in and change their investment to, you know, what they prefer. So this, is, this goes back to what I was saying, like the plan according to the Department of Labor, you wanna have a balance fund or a lifestyle fund. 
Um, the, you know, back in the day, you used to be able to have a money market or a stable value fund, and that was sufficient for a default fund, but that is no longer an option. That's not enough. You have to have a fund that is, you know, at least if not more keeping up with inflation, that's, that's actually earning, has positive earnings in the account that's, you know, not aggressive, it could still be conservative. Um, but it has to be it has to be more than the old money market um, fund that used to be okay back in the day. Okay, so moving on to timely deposits of your 401k plan and loan repayment. I often get this question, and and this is a common error um, where clients don't always realize that it's important that. Um, they deposit, you know, the, you know, they have a pay, the employee makes a deferral election and then, the, you know, it's taken out of their paycheck and then that needs to be um, deposited at the record keeper as soon as administratively possible. And um, the Department of Labor is all, is, this is, you know, important to them, important issue. Um, so one type of, of uh, restriction is on the safe harbor small plan. So, a small plan today, the changed effective in one one of twenty three, is um, you know for is the definition is a uh, plans that have an account balance um, with uh, less than a hundred uh, participants, and so if that's the case, you're considered a small plan, and your deposit for your payroll should be made within seven business days after it's deducted from their paycheck. And keep in mind that it really is as soon as administratively possible. And it really needs to be an automated process that's consistent each time. So I will say that, um, you know, because it is something that's important. And you do want to get, you want to think about your employees and let them, you know, have their money invested as soon as possible as well. It's for their benefit. The other type of plan is a large plan. So if you have employees um, and with account balances of that over a hundred. Now you are considered a large plan and there's certain rules, there's different rules for that. And um, the deposit again is as soon as administratively possible. And uh, we're gonna mention the old rule, which used to be the 15th business day of the month following, but I can tell you that's no longer uh, acceptable because today you can get your money um, deposited the record keeper much sooner and um, the Department of Labor if they audited you they're looking for consistency so if you consistently deposit it you know three business days after it's deducted and then suddenly you have an outlier where it's I don't know 10 days so that's considered um, a violation um, and you would you know reach out to us we would want to um, calculate, you know, missed earnings, missed opportunity earnings for those employees and make sure that that, that gets deposited back into their account. Um, and also your CPA. So when you're a large plan, now you have an audit. Um, you got a 5500, that's a large filer. And you'll have a CPA that will be auditing your plan. They'll be looking, this is something that they is on their radar, they look for. And they'll also reach out if they see an outlier where it's, you know, they're not seeing consistency with your deposit to each payroll. So that's just something to keep in mind. Make sure you have a good process. I had one client, you know, the, the client that did deposits left and therefore the other, you know, the, the employee that the, took over wasn't sure, I didn't know the rules and therefore they had what they call late contributions. So, um, you know, just be aware of that. So let's talk about the 5500, which we brought up earlier. So that's something else that Nova, you know, handles for you. And it's just, you know, required to be just, uh, submitted to the Department of Labor every year. It's an annual financial report that's electronically filed. Um, you know, thinking of, of the 23 plan year, we'll start working on it in 24. And um, the first deadline is July 31st of 24. And then if the plan is put on extension, um, in other words, like if you had, um, you know, if you needed it needed more time, then that deadline is October 15th. So we'll be reaching out to you to electronically sign your to review it and electronically sign it. It basically has, um, you know, it's an income statement of your finances for the whole year. It has the participant count. It also has several questions like fidelity bond, and the 5500 is actually publicly. Um, 
uh, available for, for anyone. You can go out to the, what they call the eFast website and look up any, um, any client's 5500. Um, so, you know, just so you're aware of that. Something else that's important is the plan's fidelity bond. That's a question on the Department of Labor. I often get asked, why, why is this, you know, why are you asking these questions? That's because the Department of Labor wants to know and it's required. So it's a, an insurance policy for your plan and it's required, it, it, you know, it's determined, it's, it should be at least 10% of your assets, um, you know, the count being on January 1st. And it can be a minimum of $1,000 up to 500,000. And I would recommend if you're not sure about your Fidelity bond, you know, reach out to Nova. We um, offer Fidelity bond for our clients. Or if um, you're working, in with, working with an insurance carrier, they also can set up um, a separate uh, insurance or, you know, ERISA bond for the plan. Um, and then if your plan is large, so we just talked about this, you're gonna need, with the 5500 that provides all the financials, the CPA is also going to have a financial statement when they do the audit of your plan and they're, you know, they have a checklist where they go through and check the eligibility. They have, um, you know, they spot check your uh, contributions. They have a whole list of, of items that they audit. Um, then they, they provide a financial statement um, for NOVA, which gets attached to your uh, 5500 that's also required um, each year as well. All right, let's talk about payroll integration. So ideally, if you hadn't thought about integration, um, it's a great um, option for your plan to, you know, remove some of the administrative burden on yourself and to automate some of the processes. So for example, um, this is, this is, you know, the integration works between the payroll providers. So whether you're with, I don't know, pay, so you have an out, an outsourced payroll provider, like ADP, Paylocity, Paycom, whoever that may be. Um, and then that company, you know, then, um, submits all the data to your record keeper. So let's say that's John Hancock and Power Principal, whoever that may be. Um, and in that they include everything, all the, all the, demographic and financial information, and um, they also include all employees. And that's a great benefit for you. And as I said, you wanna, this is a great, if you haven't looked into it already, I would highly recommend um, just, it kind of helps automate your plan. You know, if the record keeper has all the information they need, that makes it easier to, they can go ahead and provide the termination packet. Um, to the employees, so to help them, you know, get paid out of the plan. Um, they can also track enrollment and help, you know, give your employees the, the enrollment information that they need. They're great. It's a great service to set up if, if that's an option for you. Um, address changes and rehires. So it just, they can work together as a partnership and kind of take that burden away from you. So with the payroll integration, there are two types, and maybe you've heard of these already, but we're going to briefly just mention or go over them. A payroll 360, it's, it's, it, it's ideal. So if, if you can have this set up where the record keeper and the payroll company are communicating back and forth, so, you know, the, the census file goes and the payroll file goes from the payroll company to the record keeper, and then the record keeper is also communicating back. They also submit information back to your payroll company so that your payroll company can update deferral changes, uh, maybe loan requests and things of that nature that your employees have gone on their website and, and initiated. Um, and then there's another option. So the, the payroll 180, so it's, it's one-sided. It's still better than not having any integration, but basically the payroll company is providing the census file back to the record keeper um, but there's not that turnaround where the record keeper is going back to the payroll company. So these are great two options just to, um, you know, something to look into further um, and make sure that you're aware of those. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to talk about, you know, just common errors that as account managers we see and that you should just be aware of. So. Um, the first is excluding bonuses from um, deferral elections. Just keep in mind, if you're not excluding bonuses, then 
then those should be also included um, as in, in deductions taken from the bonus. Um, Part-time employees, I get this question a lot because I think other benefits um, provide that the part-time employee is excluded, but for, in the 401k plan world, a part-time employee is not excluded from the plan unless it specifically is excluded by category. So if the part-time employee works and meets the criteria, they're also eligible to be in the plan. So that's something just to be aware of and to look at and make sure you're not excluding them. Um, Catch-ups. So when you have matches and thinking of, of employer match, you want to make sure that you add up both the catch-up and the non-catch-up. And we talk about catch-up very loosely, you know, very, it, it means that if you are age 50 or older, you can contribute more in salary deferrals than someone who is less than, um, than 50. So, um, and often I see some clients, they separate the catch up from the non catch up, but you want to make sure those are added together when you're calculating the match. And the same goes for Roth and pre tax. You know, you could have an employee that's doing 1% Roth and 6% pre tax. They're doing both in, in, a, in one payroll. So, you want to make sure when you're calculating their safe harbor or any kind of match that those contributions are added together. Um, something else employees or clients often forget is to distribute the summary plan description. So every year, you know, you have your annual notices. So you could have a safe harbor notice or, you know, a fee disclosure or QDI notice. Um, you want to make sure that every year annually, you make sure that, that you are communicating with your employees and also for all your newly eligible employees. Don't forget about them. Along with the enrollment material, they also need to be provided the notices. So um, something to keep in mind. And then along with that, just you know, make sure that you track if you have a quarterly entry. So, okay, you know, let's say the quarter, quarterly entry is April 1st, you start looking um, you know, in February, who, who are those employees? Make sure they're gonna be given the opportunity to enroll. And then not capping uh, matching contribution based on the compensation cap. So we'll go over that. We have an example of that in just a second. So here we have an example of, um, you know, ABC company um, has no service, no age requirement, but Steve um, has been in there, been working for six months and was not given the opportunity to enroll. So you want to make Steve whole. Um, he wasn't, you know, he missed out on six months of deferrals, basically, and earnings and match. And, and so you want to reach out to your account manager, and we'll be glad to um, make that uh, do the calculation for you and calculate any missed deferrals and match and missed earnings for them. But just keep that in mind. That's what we're here for. And it's not, you know, it's, it's a common mistake and just, you know, just be aware of that. Here's an example of the capping the match. So, you know, let's say you have an employee, let's say your match is 50% of the first 6%. And um, maybe your payroll company um, isn't limiting, um, you know, capping these employees. Your employee, uh, let's say they made 500,000 in the year and therefore they exceeded the match. You wanna just be aware, okay, so does my employer, does my uh, payroll company, will they limit the match? And this is not the end of the world. When, when NOVA does your discrimination, uh, does your compliance testing, this is one of the items that we're looking for. We're looking for excesses, and we'll let you know if, if an employee went over uh, the limits, and um, then that amount, that will it will be um, forfeited and kept in your plan to use for future contributions or for to pay for expenses for your plan. Okay, initial eligibility. So um, we want to talk just briefly about, you know, you know, eligibility is like the first step with your plan as far as who who's eligible. Um, the Congress has said the maximum that you can do or, you know, the maximum weight is one year of service and age 21, and they must be able to come in at least twice a year. And typically I see July, uh, January 1st and July 1st. Um, that's the maximum. But, you know, if you're thinking of retaining employees, it really is client specific because I have, a, you know, some clients that are, you know, they want to, um, you know, re retention is important, the 401k plan is important, and so therefore they've shortened 
the eligibility. It could be it could be a lapsed time. So it could be six months. It could be it could be zero. It could be you come in and you are enrolled immediately. So it's really up to the client. I have other clients that have a high turnover. So um, they don't they want to make sure the employees are there a year and have put in some time before they have them be eligible because it's expensive as we know and um, you know they have employees coming and going. So it really is a, a client decision. Um, but and keep in mind the age requirement cannot exceed age 21. So that's just something to keep in mind of. And here's an example of you know again with the one year service. Uh, you know, you have an employee that's hired June of 22 for the first year, it's off anniversary date. So from June 1 to 22 to June uh, 1 of 23, we're looking, did they have a thousand hours? And if they did have a thousand hours, that's great. They come in July 1, that's their entry date. But let's say they did not have a thousand hours in this time frame. Then it switches to calendar year. So for the next year, you start looking at calendar year. So for 23, you're going to look at uh, January to December. Did they have a thousand hours then? It, let's say they did. Now they have a thousand hours. Well, then they come into the plan one one of 24. So this is a great example of um, you know how eligibility can be a little bit tricky. Rehire. So. When you have a rehired employee, um, the biggest thing to keep in mind is if they ever put any money in the plan, ever were had a vested dollar, one dollar in the plan, they never lose any prior service. They could be gone 10 years and come back to the, your company and they are eligible on their rehire date. So something to keep in mind. And then, um, but let's say they did not have any vested dollars. Um, and they were gone more than five years. If they were gone more than five years from the time the terminated to the rehire, then they do start over. But it's only after five years. So typically I see rehires that are less than five years. If it's less than five years, they come in on their rehire date. And that's something I also ask my clients to call me about so that I can go over. It's very specific to the employee, right? And often they may not know if they even had a vested dollar in the plan. So um, that's something, you know, rehires of their own are very treated, you know, they're outlier, they're treated special, and they do not uh, automatically just start over with eligibility. So that would be the common sense, so to speak, um, but that's not how it works with rehires. Okay, on to testing. So another important part of our job is our, is our discrimination testing that NOVA does for you. So in January, when we send out the data collection, we're wanting to get this process started. This is the first step. You send back the census and then you answer the questions. Then we start looking at your plan and we start doing, you know, we're looking at coverage testing. You know, if you excluded, let's say, um, you know, certain classes of employees, we wanna make sure you pass that testing. We look at if you did a profit sharing allocation, it, did, it pass, did it pass testing? And um, compensation, let's say you're excluding bonuses and commissions, does it still pass testing? So these are important testing that we are required to follow to keep your plan in compliance. So we're doing a lot of things behind the scenes um, that you, you know, you're going to get a copy of your 60 page um, testing results. But just to give you an idea of that, some of the some of the rules that were regulations that we're following. Um, another big test is in the discrimination is the ADP test. So keep in mind if you're playing a safe harbor, another benefit is you are exempt from the ADP test, which is huge. So you will not have failed testing, you may not have, you won't have refunds. Um, but this test is takes your employee contributions and compares basically your highly compensated to your non-highly compensated or your staff. And typically, um, the highly, you know, if you have your non-highly at 2%, for example, that's their average, then the highly is to, the most they can do on average is 4%. It's typically about a 2%, um, uh, you know, difference that, you, you know, uh, you know, that you can without failing testing. So keep that in mind. So what is the definition of a highly compensated employee? So that is an employee that we look at prior year. So if they had earnings and compensation that was 135,000 or greater in the prior year, now they're in that highly compensated category. 
or if they are greater than a 5% owner. Automatically, it doesn't matter what their compensation is, they are also what we call an HCE. And then you look at family members. So, you know, if you have this, the government must have decided, you know, you can't be trying to get around the rules by giving your children or spouse a higher comp, you know, trying to uh, negate some of the rules. So now they've said, you know, family members are, and spouse can also count as, as HCE. So um, that's something, doesn't matter what their, what their compensation is either. Top heavy testing. So the plan that's safe harbor is, uh, is also exempt from top heavy testing. This is an, another test that we're required to do instead of looking at deferrals. Now we're looking at balances. They require us to compare um, similar to, you know, HCE versus this, the staff, but now we're looking at what they call key employees to non-key. And how many of your keys have balances? And if that's over 60% of the total, now the plan is top heavy and you may be required to make an employer contribution to satisfy that test. So let's talk about what, an, what is a key employee. So that again is you know similar to an HC an HCE where it's greater than a five percent owner, um, but also there's other rules. Is it you know a one percent owner with one hundred and fifty thousand or an officer with two hundred thousand? And again, family family is a big deal. They all they count they get counted you know just as the owner does. So um, that's something you know the spouse and the children. That's again why we ask that in the data collection. Who's your family? And we want you to list all of them out so we can decide if they should be included in the test or not. Safe Harbor, so I talked a little bit about that, but they are, have a great advantage of being exempt from ADP, ACP testing and top heavy testing. So here's an example of, of two options um, for Safe Harbor. You got your Safe Harbor match. So the minimum Safe Harbor that you can have, and this is an employer matching contribution that's 100% busted. So 100% of the first three, 50% of the next two the next two. So if you contribute at least 5% in the plan of your deferrals or Roth, then you get a match of 4%. 4% is the maximum. Um, and then the other option is non-elective. This is not looking at contributions. It's only looking at compensation. You know, whatever your compensation is when you're an eligible employee, we take 3% of that. And that is the safe harbor match. And again, these are all 100% busted. So this is a good option if you can afford it. I have some clients that it's expensive. They have a large plan. It's not an option for them. It would be too costly. So then they still have to do the you know, uh, discrimination testing, which is, which is fine. Okay, so I'm gonna move it on to Allison now, and she's going to talk about moving pieces. And we'll change our presenters. All right. Thanks for getting started with webinar, Ginger. I'm going to take over here on moving pieces. And some of these items were covered a little bit earlier by Ginger, so I won't get into a lot of details on these. Uh, but we have the record keeper or the also known as the investment provider. So uh, they're the company that's handling the assets for the plan, the investments, all the transactions that are happening with investments are happening there at the record keeper. They also maintain the plan sponsor and participant reporting, and they may do some education and other communications for the plan. You also have your third party administrator or TPA for short. Uh, so that's Nova's role. We focus on your plan's compliance testing, as Ginger was just talking about. Uh, we also do consulting on the plan. We help you get an optimal plan design so it doesn't create a huge administrative burden for you. We work on distribution and loan processing and we have a whole team that handles that and they have a lot of expertise in that matter. 
We also do the government reporting and disclosures. So as Ginger mentioned earlier, uh, the Form 5500 that has to be done every year, that's something that NOVA prepares and asks you as a client to sign. And then we also have the investment advisor. So uh, they're the ones that are helping you choose the investment offerings for the plan. Uh, they're likely doing an annual review meeting with you to go over those investments and performance. And they will also help out with things like enrollment for your plan participant. All right, so how does the money get to the record keeper? So most record keepers will have a secure website that you can upload the contribution information to. Uh, once it's uploaded, then the contributions are tracked separately by the type. And that is important because you may have many different things such as uh, Roth, pre-tax employee contributions. You may have other employer contributions like a match or profit sharing or safe harbor. And Ginger mentioned earlier that you may wanna set up payroll integration. So that would simplify the process of submitting those contributions. Who calculates the employer matching contributions? So this is a good question and it will vary depending on how your plan is set up. If you have a payroll by payroll match, that's something that would be calculated by the payroll company and those cal those contributions would be submitted then each payroll period to the record keeper if it's an annual match that is something generally that nova is calculating for you and you would need to tell us what type of match you would like to make each year unless it is already specified in your plan document such as a safe harbor match that always has a specific formula that needs to be used Who is responsible for preparing the Form 5500? So as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, unless there's some type of special arrangement, NOVA is the one that is actually preparing that Form 5500. And as a reminder, that is the form that is including all the financial transactions for a year and your participant counts, that kind of information. And it is your responsibility as the plan sponsor to review that form for accuracy, and then it needs to be signed electronically and it gets submitted to the DOL. And as Ginger mentioned earlier, it is a public form, so you can view your plans form 5500 or really anyone's 5500 electronically on the eFAST website. How does an employee get distribution paperwork upon termination of employment? So the best practice is to give the employee information regarding taking a distribution from the plan on the exit interview. So that may include either a paper form for the record keeper or instructions on how to complete the request electronically uh, directly with the record keeper. So that's companies like John Hancock, American Funds, Empower, whoever you're using as your record keeper, uh, that's where the request gets submitted. And NOVA can also help. We have the ability to mail information directly to employees if they aren't able to print the forms on their own, or our team can also help the employees make those requests online. Who is responsible for distributing required notices? So this was mentioned a little bit earlier. There are many types of notices that are required for retirement plans, including the summary plan description. That is a document that is written in plain language and covers all the important uh, provisions for your plan that is required to be distributed once someone becomes eligible. And then there are some requirements for giving that out again if there are changes that are made to the plan. You have your summary annual report. 
This gets prepared every year along with the Form 5500, and it does need to go out to the employees. And there's some different deadlines depending on when your Form 5500 was due, uh, but it's generally within a few months of that being submitted to the DOL. There's a special tax notice. So that needs to be provided along with any distribution form. And that's to let your employees know uh, what the taxation is for a distribution that they take from the plan. And there are different roles depending on how they're getting that distribution paid to them, if it's a rollover or a taxable withdrawal. And it does depend on what their age is as well. There is an annual safe harbor notice. So if you do have a safe harbor plan, one of the requirements is that a notice needs to be given out to employees each year. That notice must be given out no later than December 1st. So we just passed December 1st for, for um, 2023. So that would be the 2024 safe harbor notice that would have needed to be distributed by that date. The notice should also be given out when employees are becoming eligible for the plan so that they're aware of the safe harbor contributions that are being made. Another notice is called the 404A5 fee disclosure. Uh, this is commonly known as a participant fee disclosure notice. And this is something that would be prepared by the record keeper that you work with. And this is also something that employees should be getting when they're becoming eligible for the plan so that they can review the investment costs and returns and make appropriate decisions based on that. And that's another thing that has to go out annually each year before the plan starts. There's the Qualified Default Investment Alternative Notice or QDIA for short. That notice talks about the investment that participants will be put into if they don't make their own election into the plan. And that is also something that needs to go out annually. Another notice, which may or may not apply to your plan, this would only be if you have an automatic enrollment option in your plan. So it's called the annual automatic enrollment notice. And this also needs to go out before the start of the year. So there's many of these notices, you probably heard me say, are going out before the beginning of the year. So you can bundle them together and send them out or deliver them in person to, to your employees uh, at least a month before the plan year starts. So we have a sister company called AFS and they can help do some of these administrative functions for you. They have different service levels, but uh, they do have an option for just handling these annual notices so that you don't have to worry about it. So if you are interested, um, I have an email up here on the screen for contacting AFS and there's also a brochure in the handouts that has more information about their services and it's a really great option if you don't want to worry about forgetting a notice or all the mailing. Great option to use AFS. All right, we'll get into some more details on distribution basics now. So once money goes into a 401k plan, it is subject to the rules of when the money can leave. So there's very specific rules that are set by the IRS and NOVA is always working to keep your plan in compliance. So we monitor these rules and uh, make sure that employees aren't accessing their funds before they're able to. So some of the specific times when money can be accessed are termination of employment or retirement. So if an employee is no longer working at the company, they are then eligible to take their money out of the plan if they choose. At age 59 and a half, this is a very common time when retirement plans allow for in-service withdrawals. So someone that's still working, uh, but they may want to access some of their funds. A lot of times there's an option for this. Hardship withdrawals, 
are another reason to take funds out. So uh, there's some specific reasons allowed by the IRS for hardship withdrawal, which I'll get into in a little bit. And then if there's a death of a participant or if they become fully disabled, this is another time that the funds can be accessed from the account. All right, so some more specifics on termination of employment or retirement. So it is possible to submit a form before an employee's termination date, uh, but it's really not best practice to do that because they can't actually remove funds until they've technically stopped working at the company. And additionally, most rec record keepers won't distribute the funds until uh, the final payroll contributions have actually been submitted to them. And this is just to prevent having to send out multiple checks uh, because maybe someone took their money out and then one week later, there's another contribution that comes in, the record keeper would then need to issue another check. So uh, they prefer to just simplify that process and have a short waiting period after that date of termination before they'll process the request. And uh, as mentioned earlier, this special tax notice does need to be provided along with any kind of distribution form. And a lot of times that notice is included right on the same form. It's all um, in those multiple pages. So age 59 and a half, as I mentioned, this is something that is an optional provision. A lot of plans include this, but not all. So once an employee reaches age 59 and a half, if the plan permits it, they can start uh, taking withdrawals to help them while they're preparing for retirement, but still working. Hardship distribution, so a few more details on this. Again, it's an optional provision, so some plans include this, but some don't. And it allows employees access to their accounts in the case of an emergency while they're still working. And generally, these hardship withdrawals are going to be subject to penalty tax, so that's the early withdrawal before age 59 and a half. Uh, when they take those funds out of the plan, it's a taxable withdrawal. And then when they file their tax return, there's a 10% penalty tax that applies as well. So in the last year or so, we have the SECURE Act uh, 2.0, which has actually simplified the process for hardship withdrawals. And this this applies to a lot of plans, but not every single plan at NOVA. So if your plan allows for it, employees are able to self-certify their hardship distribution. So they can just sign a form uh, that says they meet the conditions for requesting the hardship, and that prevents them from needing to submit additional paperwork with their hardship request. Uh, some plans still do require the hardship documentation, which is usually things like bills or uh, proof of what they're requesting the money for. So if you're not sure if your plan requires this or not, I would suggest that you contact your account manager with questions. And here are the specific reasons allowed by the IRS for hardship withdrawals. So purchase of a primary residence, to prevent eviction from a home, uh, unreimbursed medical expenses, post-secondary education, so tuition expenses, uh, casualty losses, so that'd be due to some kind of natural disaster, and burial expenses. So these are some rules that went into effect a few years back and this is just as a reminder, because I know some people have been working with retirement plans for a while and they might still think of these old rules, but uh, participants no longer have to take a loan before requesting a hardship. Uh, they also don't have to stop contributing to the 401k plan for six months. That used to be a rule, but that no longer applies. 
and the investment earnings on employee contributions are available for withdrawals. It used to be that employees could only take out the actual contributions that they made to the plan, but now they have the access to the earnings as well. And depending on how the plan is set up, they may also be able to take out the employer contributions for hardships along with safe harbor contributions. So you'll want to check your plan document or contact your account manager if you have questions on what your plan allows for. So death distributions, this is another reason for taking money from the plan. This is done typically based on a beneficiary election. So whatever an employee has completed on the record keepers website or possibly on a paper form that you as the employer are maintaining, uh, they specify who their beneficiary is. So who would get the funds if they were to pass away? And there are some rules. So a married participant must have their spouse sign off if they are trying to name someone other than their spouse as the beneficiary. That's something that typically has to be notarized. So it's proof that the spouse really did sign off on the request. And in the event that there is no beneficiary election on file and someone passes away, the plan document does tell us how to distribute the account uh, so that it doesn't have to remain in the plan. It typically first would go to the spouse and then children are the next in line and parents of that participant and finally the estate if um, they don't have any of those first individuals that I mentioned. Required minimum distributions. So this is the time of year where NOVA is typically handling the required minimum distributions for the plan. So it's possible that some of the people on the call may have received an email about this recently. So there's been several changes to the age for required minimum distributions. For a very long time, this was at 70 and a half, and recent law changes have increased the age. So it was previously at 72, and currently it's at 73 that someone that is a 5% owner or a former employee, they are required to start taking money out of the plan. So if it's someone that's over age 73 and they're still working and they're not an owner or related to an owner, they can generally delay taking those distributions until they have uh, terminated employment or retired from the company. And if you have questions on whether or not someone needs to take that, I would suggest asking your account manager because the, the rules can be a little bit tricky. Qualified domestic relations orders. So this is in short known as a quadro or uh, maybe you're, you'll hear the term just a dro for domestic relations order. This generally comes up during a divorce. So this is the document that has to go through the court system and it assigns a portion of the account balance from a participant to typically their ex-spouse. Uh, that's not the only situation that these can come up in, but it's generally the most common situation. And the rules for these orders are very complicated. So if anyone ever asks about it or mentions this to you, I would highly suggest reaching out to your account manager with questions so that they can help you get it processed. Spousal consent. So this used to be extremely common uh, because when retirement plans started, most of them were defined benefit plans and annuities are the, the normal form of payment. So that requires spousal consent. I would say I've only worked on a few 401k plans that actually require spousal consent. It's extremely common that they do not require a spouse to sign off before a participant makes a distribution election. 
there may be some situations where the spousal consent is required, uh, but generally it's not. So if you have questions about whether this applies, you can always ask your account manager, but in the majority of cases, this does not apply to 401k plans. All right, I'm going to get into the basics on loans now. This is another thing that is an optional provision. A lot of plans do allow for loans, but it is not something that is required to be offered. Uh, participants really like this idea. They have access to some funds from their 401k account. Uh, because it's usually pretty restricted, as I mentioned before, about when they can access money. So it's not a taxable event. If they take out a loan, it doesn't create taxation for them unless they don't pay it back or if they leave employment, then it generally does become taxable. Uh, the loan has to comply with the IRS rules and plan requirements, and those are all spelled out in the legal plan document. Participants are able to borrow the lesser of 50% of their vested account balance or $50,000. So most loans provide a minimum of 1,000, meaning that someone has to have at least $2,000 to be eligible for that $1,000 loan. And if someone is trying to take out a maximum loan of $50,000, they would need to have at least $100,000 in their account. Loans have to be set at a reasonable interest rate. Uh, most commonly in the plans that NOVA administers, this is set at 2% above prime. So the rate is changing as the prime interest rate is changing. I believe right now prime is set at 8.5%. So the loan rate would be at 10.5%. And that interest is not going to NOVA or the record keeper. It's actually paid back into the plan participants account. So they're paying themselves interest. Loans must generally be paid back within five years unless the loan is taken out for the reason of purchasing a primary residence. Uh, then those loans can be allowed to, to be taken out for longer than five years. And that's usually specified in the legal plan document. And most commonly, loans are paid back through payroll deductions. They may, there may be some exceptions to that, but in general, that is the best way to assure that those payments are being made timely is to just set it up through payroll. And they are paid back on a post-tax basis. So it's not a pre-tax deduction for the loan payment. Once someone terminates employment, generally the loan does become due and payable. And if the employee isn't able to pay back the loan at that time, uh, eventually it will become a taxable distribution and they'll get a form 1099-R to report the taxes and they would be responsible for coming up with the tax money when they actually file their income tax return. And most loans do include a fee for setting it up. So NOVA charges $100 and most of the record keepers do also charge a monthly or annual maintenance fee for maintaining the loan. And all costs for the loan are charged to the plan participant. It is not something that the employer is paying for. The quickest way to get a plan loan is for employees to go online on their record keepers website. Uh, most of them offer that functionality. Some may just require a paper form is completed, but if possible, go online, make the request, and if offered, getting the funds issued by ACH is going to be the quickest method rather than a paper check. And if ACH isn't available, there is usually some options for doing an expedited shipping for an additional cost. All right, I'm going to get into the annual calendar now just to give you an idea of what's coming up and 
just keep in mind that NOVA is constantly trying to improve our processes. So uh, some of the things on here for the requests we're making or things we're working on, they may change as we update those processes to improve things for everyone. Uh, but one thing you'll notice on each of the months, we've got information on entry dates or getting ready to give notices to newly eligible employees. So I'll cover that on the first one and then I, I won't mention that on the other slides. But uh, January, so this is going to be an entry date for your semi-annual plan. So the plans with two entry dates. Uh, the plans with quarterly entry dates or monthly entry dates. January 1st is all an entry date for that. And you would have wanted to look at this at least a month before to consider who's becoming eligible in January so that you could get that enrollment material out to those employees and allow them the opportunity to participate. January is also the time of year when fourth quarter statements are being sent out by the record keepers. And the biggest thing for NOVA in January is this is when we are asking you for your year end census file. So the census file that applies to uh, the year prior. So in January 2024, NOVA is asking you for your 2023 census file. It is really important that you send the information for the census as soon as possible uh, because we have a very short amount of time to get the work done in this like first quarter of the year. So I would suggest handling that right away and we can help you if you have questions on the census file. So uh, try not to let it overwhelm you. You can definitely reach out to your account manager if you need help. And January is also the month when the 1099Rs are sent out by the record keepers. So that would be reporting any types of distributions that happened in the prior year. That's when those tax forms go out so that the participants are able to report those with their income tax return. So getting into February, you may still be working on year-end census information. ANOVA is starting to do the work on the annual compliance testing. March, we're still continuing that work, and this is when the deadline is for non-safe harbor plans that are subject to the ADP ACP testing. Uh, the deadlines for those have to go out no later than March 15th in order to avoid paying an excise tax on the refunds that might be needed. And please keep in mind that that's the drop dead deadline, but most of the record keepers that we work with have an earlier deadline to assure that everything's processed. So, you know, if NOVA's reaching out and trying to get information related to that annual work, please respond timely because we don't want you to pay this excise tax if you don't have to. So that's, that's our ultimate goal with asking for information. Moving into April, that's when the first quarter statement would be sent out by the record keeper, either electronically or possibly paper. This is the deadline for required minimum distributions or RMDs for short. Uh, the first RMD can be taken either in the year that someone turns 70 and a half or they can push it off to this April 1st of the next year. Uh, but then they're required to take two required minimum distributions in the same year. So I think a lot of people prefer to split it up and just do it in the first year uh, by the end of the year and then in the next year by the end of the year as well. But the option is there to take it in April as well. Another deadline is refunds for 402G overages. So this is when employees exceed the deferral limit, so their employee contributions that go in. The IRS has limits set on this each year and uh, people cannot go above this limit or uh, they're subject to paying tax on the excesses. So you wanna make sure to get those things processed before April. So definitely notify your account manager if you ever notice that someone has gone over the limit. So for 2023, the limit is 22,500 for those that are under age 50. And 
if employees are 50 or older, they have another $7,500 in catch up that they can contribute. May is when NOVA is starting the work on the Form 5500, and that's that annual uh, reporting form that gets filed to the DOL each year. So please be sure to watch for us to send out requests for signature on that. If you have a large plan that requires an audit from a CPA, this is generally about the time of year that you wanna get started at a minimum, just finding a CPA if you don't have one that you're already working with and uh, setting up a time for the audit. And then in June, we're still continuing our work on the Form 5500 and the audits. Moving into July, another quarterly statement timeframe for the uh, quarter ending June 30th. The initial deadline for the Form 5500 is due on July 31st. And if the Form 5500 is not done before that time, this is generally something that NOVA does automatically. We'll file an extension for the plan. And that simply pushes out the due date for the Form 5500 to October 15th. Then in August, this is the time of year where we can consider um, what may be helpful for your plan for consulting. So if doing a mid-year compliance test is something that would be useful, you can let us know. That's something we typically send out to the clients that we think might benefit from it. So safe harbor plans don't really have to worry about this. This is more for plans that are required to have the ADP ACP testing done. Uh, large plans, this is around the time of year that the audit should be wrapping up. They may already be done or getting close to done, uh, but we're kind of approaching the deadline here. So don't want to push it too, too far. Then for September, we've got the summary annual report that should be distributed if the 5500 was filed by July 31st. So uh, that was one of those required notices that I mentioned. Another project that NOVA is working on it's in September is the annual cash out project. So this might be known as different names. Force outs is another name that we commonly refer to this. So this is where employees that generally have less than $5,000 in the account balance and they are no longer employed at your company, they can generally be forced out of the plan. And this is something that NOVA reviews annually and we prepare the necessary forms for you and send those out for signature as needed. Moving into October, this is when the third quarter statements would be sent out to employees. And this is when the due date happens for the Form 5500. This is the extended due date of October 15th. And this is a very important deadline. So if you are hearing something from NOVA in early October regarding your 5500, that's something you definitely wanna pay attention to to make sure not to miss the deadline uh, because there are some pretty steep fees that can be applied uh, by the IRS or the DOL if you don't file timely. NOVA is getting started on our required minimum distribution work generally in October. So again, you may hear from us sometime in the fall about uh, asking maybe the status of an employee if they're still active or terminated, and we may need you to sign some paperwork for that as well. So moving into November, again, we're working on those required minimum distributions and cash outs. And then the notices that I mentioned earlier December 1st is a big deadline for a lot of the required annual notices. So a safe harbor notice, the default investment notice or QDIA for short, the auto enrollment notice, these all need to go out by December 1st to the eligible employees. December, so if you filed your Form 5500 by the extended due date of October 15th, you have to distribute that summary annual report to the employees. 
and amending plans. There's typically a deadline of end of year for getting uh, those, um, uh, excuse me, the amendments done. Requirement of distributions again have to be done by end of year. So lots of things to keep track of this time of year. We have the updated webinar schedule available on the NOVA website. The link is here, so you can check out the upcoming webinars and get registered for those. As a reminder, if you need the CPA credit, uh, make sure to fill out the evaluation survey that will pop up when the webinar is ended, and it'll be sent to you as a web link through uh, Go go to webinars and you'll receive that cert certificate within one week by email. So this will be the time for questions if we've received any and you can contact your NOVA account manager as well with questions and then I have my information and Ginger's information up on the screen. Yvette, did we receive any questions? We do have one question that came in, um, which is, what is the requirement for an audit? Um, in other words, when is an audit not required? Sure, that's a great question. And we kind of simplified things when we were talking about the audits during the presentation. Uh, but generally, when you start a 401k plan initially, if there are less than 80 eligible employees, um, you would not need an audit. And then once your plan grows to having over 120 employees with account balances, that's when the audit starts. And that count is based on the beginning of the year. So it's a little bit tricky because the rules just changed between 2022 and 2023. So it's possible if there was an existing plan that was audited, they might no longer need an audit because of these new rules. So the rules used to strictly be for eligible employees plus terminated employees with account balances. Uh, but now because of some of the recent law changes for long-term part-time employees, the IRS decided to make things a little bit easier for plan sponsors, and they're just strictly looking at the people with account balances. And I would say if there's a specific plan sponsor that's on the call and you're wondering whether or not your plan is audited, I would highly suggest reaching out to your assigned account manager and they can help look at that. Awesome. And that's the only question that came in, so we can go ahead and close out this session. Um, just a few reminders. Uh, if you go to your GoTo panel that's on the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a drop down for handouts. This is where you'll, you're going to find today's uh, presentation, um, and you can download from there. If you're not able to see the panel uh, or see that on your panel, you can email us and we'll send those handouts to you. Um, for CE credit, be sure to fill out the pop-up survey uh, once the session ends. For any questions, you can email us webinars at nova401k.com. To view any, uh, any webinars you may have missed and the recording of this session, you can follow us on our YouTube channel, which is Nova401k Associates, or you could visit our website, which is www.nova401k.com backslash webinars. Thank you so much, Allison and Ginger, for your time today. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.